weekend, we are very much in the 2024 general elections. Joe Biden and Donald Trump, they are holding dueling rallies in the battleground state of Georgia today. President Biden will make his pitch for four more years to voters in Atlanta. And just about an hour's drive outside of Atlanta, Trump will host a rally in Marjorie Taylor Greene's district. Of course, this is not a normal election. In many ways, Georgia is ground zero for election denialism and, well, the scene of the crime. Trump faces 13 criminal counts in Fulton County for his attempt to nullify Biden's 2020 win in the state. Joining us now, MSNBC political contributor and White House correspondent for Politico, Eugene Daniels, and Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark and host of one of my favorite podcasts, The Focus Group. Good morning to you both. Good morning. So uh, let's, uh, before we get into Biden on the road... Let's talk about what Biden did in the House. <laughs> uh, the let's, on the, it was just an amazing moment, I thought. Um, first off, the president comes to the podium and doesn't even, like, wait to get introduced. <laughs> immediately starts his speech. And, of course, the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, is standing there going, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What was your estimation of that moment? And... What did it signal to you as you watched that speech unfold and covering Biden as you have, the, the contrast, if you will, between the Biden coming in to that moment and the Biden who just owned it? Mm -hmm. One, his team was raising expectations in interviews before. I talked to the chief of staff on Wednesday. I was a little nervous because when I talked to him, he was like, yeah, it's a big deal. It's a big old deal and Joe Biden's going to do great. And I was like, OK, that's not typically how people talk about states of the union. Right. They try to lower the bar. Um, but they felt really confident going in. And then you could see why. Like, it's objective that Joe Biden went up there. He ran that room in a way that he wanted to. Kind of like those comedians on TikTok and Instagram who are doing crowd work. Yeah. Right? Like, he was doing his jokes. He wanted, he wanted to go back, right? He like wanted to go back and forth with them. He wanted to do that. But on the substance, right, he starts with Ukraine, January 6th, and abortion <laughs> and IVF, right? And so that is how they are saying this is what, these are the most important things for this election, democracy and Dobbs. That is what he said on that stage on Thursday. And also, he picked a lot of things that divide the Republican um, Party across the country, right? Ukraine, <laughs> abortion, yeah. IVF all of those things. And he did that throughout. He wanted to make clear to voters these th they are out of step on these issues with you. We saw that yesterday when he was in Pennsylvania, and we're going to continue to see that we're in Georgia and moving on as they go forward. I mean, one of my favorite moments, Sarah, from the State of the Union, my top moment, it started early. It was uh, when the president uh, was talking about Roe, talking about the Dobbs decision, quotes Justice Alito, who was not there. He doesn't... Uh, Justice Alito hasn't attended a, a State of the Union since he since the camera panned to him, got caught making faces. But the cameraman pans to the justices as this moment happens. I'm sure we will get the clip and we'll show it a little bit later in this show. But that, that was my favorite moment and I think it really encapsulates kind of what we're going to get in this longest general election ever. What did you think? Where did you watch it? Did you have a focus group? <laughs> I did have a focus group. And I'll tell you, though, before I get to the focus group we did yesterday, uh, where we got people's reactions, I want to tell you, I've been talking to voters now across the political spectrum for years, every week. And if there was one thing that Democrats wanted to see from Joe Biden, they wanted to see a fighter, right? They want somebody who is going on offense, who has a knife in their teeth. And last night, or during the State of the Union, that's what they got. And so I think, uh, you know, the and the substance was obviously there to rally Democrats. Like, Joe Biden's numbers have been soft. His approval numbers have been low. Um, and so I think the substance of the speech was there to rally Democrats to him, to say, no, I'm your guy. I can go fight for you. And then the tone, the style, uh, was meant to shore up concerns from voters where who think that Joe Biden, honestly, I hear this from voters all the time. They think he's senile, right? They think he has dementia. They don't see him very often. They don't go around watching all of his speeches. And so when you talk about the bar being set really low, Republicans and also the voters believe it in part because Republicans are on a 24-7 
offense crusade to make sure that voters think Joe Biden has dementia, that they think, you know, they make all these super cuts of him um, either looking confused or shuffling. And as a result, when voters don't see him that much, they can start to think that's who he is. And so when he comes out and looks as good as he looked the other night and was on offense and was jousting and going off script um, with Republicans, it gives voters who are kind of on the fence permission to say, you know what, he's okay, he's got it, he'll be fine. And I think that shored up a lot of hesitancy that people were having. And I do think it will stop this sort of drip, drip, drip from Democrats who've been saying, boy, we need another candidate, we need to replace him on the ticket, he needs to step aside. I don't think you're gonna see those op-eds again, at least not for a while. <laughs> I hope no more of those op-eds, people living in the fantasy land. Sarah, to your point about the president going on offense, showing that he is a fighter, there is a brand new ad out from the Biden campaign this morning. And in part, what's it, what it goes after is this idea that the president's age is a liability and not an asset. Take a listen. Look, I'm not a young guy. That's no secret. But here's the deal. I understand how to get things done for the American people. I led the country through the COVID crisis. Today, we have the strongest economy in the world. I passed a law that lowers prescription drug prices. Caps insulin at $35 a month for seniors. For four years, Donald Trump tried to pass an infrastructure law, and he failed. I got it done. Now we're rebuilding America. I passed the biggest law in history to combat climate change because our future depends on it. Donald Trump took away the freedom of women to choose. I'm determined to make Roe v. Wade the law of the land again. So as someone who experiences a ton of existential dread, Eugene, <laughs> Sarah, I, I hope that I am this prolific in my 70s and getting this much done. It gives me some sense uh, of calm. And there are two things to me that the Biden campaign is doing there. One, they're saying we're not going to run away from his age. You want to talk about his age. Let's talk about his age. Let's talk about the number of things he's been able to accomplish. And they're secondarily the comparison to Trump, right? And I wonder, Sarah, in your focus groups, how those two issues are bearing out, both the question of of the acuity of both of these candidates and the comparison points between the two of them. Well, look, uh, for, for whether it's fair or not, voters don't question Trump's mental acuity. They question his sanity. Uh, they question whether or not he's, you know, fit to be commander in chief from a moral uh, and ethical standpoint. But Trump, because he has sort of big lunatic energy, um, he, he just doesn't come off the same way that Biden does. And so the concerns from voters around age really do rest with Joe Biden. But this is super smart of the Biden campaign and something, if you do listen to my podcast, we've sort of been begging them to do for a while, which is not run away from the age thing. It is not because the media talks about his age that voters think Joe Biden is old. They think it because when they see Joe Biden, they think he seems old. And so the opportunity is you just have to hang a lantern on it. You have to say, yeah, this is experience. You have to say, I am Yoda. I am the wise protector. He is whoever the old other bad guy is in the Star Wars movies, right? You have to make it a moral uh, contrast. I would be Darth um, Vader, but that's... I was like, hold on. I think it's more Palpatine, yeah. actually. I think it's not Darth Vader. It's There's like an... But anyway, the point is, the contrast Since, has to be... You know, we can go through the list. Yeah. It has to be good. There's like good old and then there's bad old. Right. And so I think that uh, Joe Biden going on offense, you know, going out and saying, yeah, I'm old. And that brings wisdom. And that helps me understand what the country needs. And I want to leave this country in a better place because I love it. That is the right way to handle this age question, not to ignore it. Apologies to all of the Star Wars fans Alpatine. out there Alpatine. who are watching. We will get it right. Um, look, I think, well, first of all, I think Joe Biden has been old. Um, he was old the last time he ran for president. I think people know he's old. I, I really think these age questions really rest with can he do the job and is he too old? I.e., can he do the job? And I think that between the State of the Union and this ad, maybe that is what they're trying to get at. You know, Eugene, um, not only did Joe Biden give a speech uh, Tuesday, then he then fanned out, and he stayed on the floor, uh -huh. by the way. Forever. Forever. They turned the lights off, and Joe Biden was still minutes. out there chit-chatting. 30 minutes. He, you know, he loves it, honey. He loves mm -hmm. the people. Mm -hmm. uh, the administration has launched, like, this tour, if you will, and it's not just cabinet secretaries. It's the president, the vice president. I think on Friday, the vice president was in Phoenix, Arizona, for another stop on her reproductive freedoms tour. Um, the president and the first lady, they were in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, you know, Philly girl, mm -hmm. uh, Philly Jill was there, <laughs> Dr. Biden. And today, uh, Biden is going to Georgia. 
talk a little bit about what the White House is saying. What is it? Where they're saying their strategy is here with these places. I will note Arizona. Georgia, Florida, Florida it's given Ohio. battleground. Ohio is given trying to win back. Now, I think there's some people that might say, well, Florida, is it still a battleground state? Right. I think it is. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it is. I think largely when they go to Florida, they're trying to make Republicans scared that they're going to spend money there, so Republicans mm -hmm. spend and waste money there. That's, that's why it, it feels like a fake out sometimes. With, with, <laughs> I don't know if Republicans are going to do that, but I think that's where their strategy is. I mean, when, when you talk to them about this kind of tour, what they will acknowledge and have acknowledged for a while is that they haven't done a good job of selling the things that they've done for the American people, right? They have a litany of things, objectively, that they could run on, right? That they can say, we did this, we want to do more. And for whatever reason, one, it hasn't broken through. And at times, they're not consistent in, in telling that story, right? They will do like a kickoff, they'll do a couple of weeks, and that's it. I think this is a, uh, an example of them realizing and showing, no, we're going to do this for a sustained amount of time. We're going to do it with a lot of different people. It's not just going to be President Biden. So if you're someone who maybe President Biden isn't the best messenger for you, we have Mayor Steve Benjamin. If, if, if you don't like Steve Benjamin, we have Deb Holland. If you don't like Deb Holland, you know what I mean? Like, they're taking everybody and putting them out on the road. And Pete Buttigieg told my, um, my colleague Adam Wren a couple of weeks ago that this is an all-hands-on-deck moment, right? Mm -hmm. That is how this White House sees it. And I think that is probably the best play for them. Because, one, they can go out. They can't talk because of the Hatch Act. They can't go after Donald Trump and his campaign. President Biden can. Kamala Harris can. And so they'll deal with the contrast. And the rest of the crew right. will go ahead and tell the story of, the, of what they've done in the, as an administration. What they've done, and I, hopefully to hear what they will do. Mm -hmm. Okay.